everybody. Good afternoon. Hi there. Uh, my name is Corey Fabian Bornstein, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator here at the NHA. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this week's exciting Food for Thought with author Amy Janess. Uh, we thank you, as always, for supporting this wonderful free community program that is um, made possible in part by the MS Worthington Foundation and receives media sponsorship from Novation Media. Before we get started, it would be great if you could take a moment to silence or turn off your cell phone so it doesn't disrupt the presentation. And while you're doing that, I want to remind everybody that Amy's wonderful book, This Day in Nantucket History, is available at the gift shop directly after this wonderful talk, and she will be signing copies. So if you're interested, it's a great book. It's got 365 days of amazing facts on Nantucket, so definitely at least go over and check out a copy. So on that note, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about our speaker today. Uh, Amy Janess now works at the Nantucket Athenaeum, as, which is the island's wonderful public library, where she's in charge of adult programs and facilitates a, a writing group. She's also been employed here at the Nantucket Historical Association and at the Nantucket Inquirer and Meter Mirror as the features editor. Amy's journalism has appeared in many island publications, and in the past she served as the associate editor of N Magazine and the managing editor of Vermont Business Magazine. She belongs to the Moore's Poetry Collective, which is based right here on Nantucket, and her poetry has appeared in three of the group's anthologies. So on that, please join me in giving a very warm Nantucket welcome to Amy Janess. Thank you. Hello. This is a really weird twist for me. Usually I'm the one doing the introduction and getting out of there and sitting in the back of the room. So now I have to stand here and talk to you for an hour. Um, and this is the first lecture I've ever given, so we'll see how I do. But um, I think between all my different jobs, I've probably sat through a couple hundred lectures, so hopefully I've learned some things. Um, so just by way of introduction into today's talk, I want to talk a little bit about how the book came about, which was completely random. I got an email out of the blue on January 5th of this year from a small press in Charleston, South Carolina called the History Press. And it said, um, do you know anyone at the library or anyone who's spoken at the library who would like to write a book about Nantucket history? And I thought, I would like to write a book about Nantucket history. I don't really consider myself a historian, but I knew um, from my journalism background that I could approach it like a big giant um, journalism story. And so we went round and round and talked about a lot of different things, and the, the acquisitions editor at the um, History Press said, we're looking for 70,000 words. And I was like, I don't, I don't know what 70,000 words looks like. How many pages is that? And uh, so I was a little daunted at the idea of writing a book that had chapters and plot and all that stuff. And so we settled on this um, series that the History Press does. They have them for other cities and other places called On This Day in Nantucket History. And it looks at one historical fact for um, the whole year, starting January 1st, going through December 31st. And so for me, first book, that was an easy format. Each um, entry is 250 words unless it has a photo, and then it's 150 words. And uh, so there's about 130 photos, and big thank you to Ralph Henke for digging them all out of the uh, NHA archive for me. So I embarked on, oh, and the other thing is they gave me a six-month deadline. Which, I thought, so my deadline was July 14th, which is not a good time of year for me, working at the library. So I was no fun for six months. I was just home, working and writing, or I was at work. Um, but I did it, and um, as I went along, I noticed that there were certain kind of themes that came up at, during the different four seasons. And uh, it covers from 1660, when the first English white settlers first came to the island, up to about 1958, 1959. And by choice, I didn't want it to go past 1959. I wanted it to be before the age of personal computing and before the you could get to the island in an hour on the boat. And sort of before modern advances kind of changed everything. Because I wanted when people to read it, I wanted them to feel like it was kind of historical. And I also wanted to um, make sure that the island's great history of strong women and African Americans and Native Americans also were represented in the book. So it is this weird jumble of facts about Nantucket history that cover 355 years, uh, one day at a time. <laughs> so if you read the whole thing, you kind of get a scope of 
whaling and of abolitionism and of the, how the island was settled and how the island sort of came into the industrial age and into the 1900s. But, um, but it, isn't, it isn't a linear thing. Um, so, before we get to that though, I thought um, two things that were made really clear to me by my research uh, were um, Nantucket's geographic location as well as its uh, physical makeup, that those two qualities really have impacted Nantucket's history. So I thought I'd start with the big picture and then we'll zoom down and uh, cover 350 years of history in 45 minutes. Um, so here's Cape Cod, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket. Um, as you can see, Nantucket is the chunky triangular shaped uh, piece at the bottom. Nantucket County comprises the islands of Nantucket, Tuckernuck, and Muskegon. It has 304 square miles, of which 45 are land and 259 are water. Its highest point is 109 feet above sea level. It has very little nutrient-rich soil, and historically there have been very few native trees. So it's clear that agriculture and building were not going to be um, mainstays of the new settlers who got here in 1660. Um, so the obvious choice was that they had to look to the sea for food and for commerce, and those experiences would eventually lead Nantucketers all over the world hunting whales, trading in ports, and moving goods across the sea. But this picture also shows that um, the shoals, whoops, hit the wrong button. The shoals here, um, make the waters around Nantucket some of the trickiest to navigate in ships. Um, and so um, it, it was kind of a double-edged sword. There were, um, I should put on my glasses, that would help. Um, the shoals cost, uh, were a great source of concern for captains and sailors traveling around the islands, and they called um, them the graveyard of the Atlantic. And these tricky waters could snare even the most seasoned ship captain who had the misfortune to lose a mast in a storm or become lost in the fog. And uh, so here's a photo of the bark. The W.F. Marshall is photographed by Henry Wire in 1877, one of 700 shipwrecks that occurred around or on Nantucket. But the double-edged sword part is that Nantucketers learned to be um, profoundly good uh, mariners, and they had really strong nautical skills. Then here, I, as I was going through, I couldn't, I kept hearing and reading about all the different lightships and the lighthouses, and I couldn't figure out what was what. So maybe you all already know this, but I needed to make a little chart of where all the lightships lived so that um, I could kind of picture in my head where, what was going on. So the ones we'll talk about today, oh, I did it again, is Cross Rip, which is right there, the three Nantucket lighthouses, and then Nantucket Lightship, which is not on this map because it's 40 miles south of Nantucket, so it goes off the page. So for that one, I'm giving you the really big picture. The top X is the island of Nantucket, and the bottom X is the Nantucket Lightship. And, uh, and so my point, not to beat you over the head with it, is that Nantucket's extreme southeastern location really played a role in its history, and uh, it caused things to happen like um, the United States Army Signal Service, which connected the island by telegraph cable in 1886 so that it could receive weather reports. The New York Herald opened a Sconset wireless radio station in 1901 so it could communicate with boats that were passing by. And the US Navy secretly listened to Russian submarine conversations off from Tom Nevers during the Cold War. And of course, of all the lightships operated by the government, the Nantucket lightship was the furthest away from land, the first light to be seen by passengers traveling to America from Europe, and the first place the Herald installed a second wireless radio so it could beat its competitors on shipping news. So, today is October 30th. What happened on this day? 
Uh, so in what would become known as the no-name storm or the perfect storm in 1991 was simply a northeaster on October 30th. Within two days, the storm had absorbed Hurricane Grace, formed an eye, and gathered itself into a Category 1 hurricane. That new hurricane, with 75-mile-an-hour winds, turned and headed for the northeast. The no-name storm caused $200 million in statewide damage and $20 million in damage here. It's one of the most destructive to ever hit Nantucket, and Brant Point, as well as oceanfront neighborhoods in Marshfield, Situate, and Hull, sustained the heaviest damage. So now I'll just kind of zoom through um, Nantucket history on a season-by-season -season basis. And uh, so you can see for autumn, the themes are going to be privateers, bad luck ships, endings, and forward shifts. And when I started this project, I couldn't have told you the difference between a pirate and a privateer. The only difference between the two, I learned, is that a privateer has the government's permission to attack and steal ships from other countries. Privateers were a part of European naval warfare beginning in the 16th century, and during the American Revolution and the War of 1812, um, local American governments also employed them. And Nantucket men and boys enlisted on privateer ships during both of those conflicts. On September 29, 1764, a 16-year-old boy named Ebenezer Gardner signed on to a privateer called the Saucy Hound. I love that name. <laughs> Which was here on a recruiting mission. Cruising Atlantic waters in search of British ships to attack, the Saucy Hound was taken by a British ship, and Gardner spent 28 months fighting for the British, first off Yorktown and later in Europe. This is John Paul Jones, founder of the American Navy. Um, and on September 23rd in 1779, John Paul Jones, in command of the Bon Homme Richard, overtook and captured the British vessel Serapis, a loss that turned out to be a major embarrassment for the British. Fourteen Nantucket men served with John Paul Jones, first in fighting the British during the Revolution and later as privateers hired by the French. Two of those killed during the 1779 Serapis battle were Henry Martin and Thomas Turner of Nantucket. On October 11, 1814, the Prince de Neuchâtel schooner operating as a U.S. privateer during the War of 1812 engaged in one of the most violent clashes of the war five miles south of Nantucket. After 30 minutes, the Englishmen surrendered. British casualties amounted to 28 killed, 37 wounded, and 28 taken prisoner. The Americans reported five killed and 24 wounded, and Neufchatel pilot Charles J. Hilburn of Nantucket was one of the Americans killed. Bad luck ships. You all probably know who this is. Uh, on November 20th, 1820, the Nantucket whale ship Essex was rammed and sunk by a sperm whale. 2,000 miles west of South America and adrift in small open boats, the crew had virtually no food or water. For 90 days, the Essex crew drifted. Of the 20 men who left the sinking Essex, eight would survive the starvation and dehydration of the whaleboats. In the final days of their journey, one of the whaleboats disappeared and was never found, and members of the two remaining whaleboats resorted to cannibalism in order to stay alive. On December 15, 1822, the whale ship Globe left Nantucket bound for the Pacific whaling grounds. Crew member William Com Comstock led a mutiny which killed the captain and officers. Comstock's plan was to establish his own kingdom on the remote Millie Atoll in the Pacific Ocean. Later, on the atoll, the remaining crew, fearing for their lives at the hands of a madman, killed Comstock. On November 26, 1825, Nantucket whaler Cyrus M. Hussey was one of only two survivors and saw an American ship that was nearby after he'd been stranded on the Pacific Island for two years. He was rescued and on his way home within two days. And so this is just a picture of when he got back the two surviving members of the globe, Hussey and um, William Lay, um, wrote, together wrote a narrative that described their their uh, journey. So that's what that's a picture of. And on December 21st, 1979, the Liberian tanker Argo Merchant broke apart 29 miles southeast of Nantucket and caused one of the largest oil spills in history. 
The ship left Venezuela carrying 7.7 .7 million gallons of fuel and ran aground on December 15th, 24 miles off course. The Coast Guard rescued the crew, the crew, but the shallow waters and weather conditions made it impossible to offload the oil or salvage the ship. When the Argo merchant broke apart, it emptied enough fuel oil to heat 18,000 homes for a year. Fortunately for Nantucket, northwesterly winds blew the oil offshore and coastal fisheries and beaches were spared the worst. Endings. On November, on November 25th, Abram Quarry died in 1854 at the age of 82, the last male Wampanoag tribe member left on Nantucket. Quarry was born in 1768. When he was young, he lived with a white family for several years and then went whaling. He married twice and lost a child. Alone, Quarry settled into a solitary life, spending time weaving baskets, collecting herbs, and clamming. Within six weeks of his passing, Dorcas Honorable, the island's last Native American resident, also died. This is Eunice B. Paddock, the last Nantucket-born Quaker who died on September 22nd in 1900. Quakers, also known as the Society of Friends, had once dominated Nantucket's religious and political culture. But by 1820, Quakerism on Nantucket was declining, and they began to break into separate sects. The Friends' strict views, which ranged from refusing to participate in war to only marrying other Quakers, turned many people off. By the late 1860s, there were only a few Quakers on the island, and Paddock is believed to be the last. Um, this is the Nantucket Weather Station. It closed after 79 years of service to the United States Weather Bureau on November 16, 1970. The United States Army Signal Service first began the first formal observing program in 1886 after the island had been connected to the mainland by a telegraph cable. The United States Weather Bureau took over in 1891, working from the Pacific Club building. In 1904, the Bureau moved to a newly built Weather Bureau building at 46 Orange, which this is a photo or a postcard of. With a growing need for weather information for aviation, the Bureau was moved to the airport in 1946 and turned over to the FAA in 1970. Um, on October 19, 1903, the U.S. Navy began to take control of radio communication on board the Nantucket Lightship, and it accomplished it within a year. The Italian-owned Marconi wireless system revolutionized the maritime world when the New York Herald installed it on the Nantucket Lightship in Sconset in 1901. The United States government had been experimenting with other radio systems, but none worked as well as the one invented by the Italian. But the government broke its monopoly when the Navy installed an American-made wireless station on the Nantucket Lightship in 1904. 18 years later, on November 3, 1922, RCA, which now owned the Marconi Wireless Company, closed the storied Sconset Wireless Station. And on December 18, 1975, the U.S. Navy announced plans to close the Tom Nevers Navy base. Established in 1955 during the Cold War, the Navy described it as an oceanographic research station, but in truth, the top secret base was used to track Soviet submarine activity throughout the Atlantic Ocean. In addition, the government built a bomb shelter there in 1962 for President John F. Kennedy to use in the event of a nuclear attack while he was visiting family in Hyannis Port. And forward ships. So, you're looking at a picture, but the actual painting is behind you on the wall. Um, and uh, this is Nantucket whaling master Timothy Folger. On October 29, 1768, postmaster for the colonies Benjamin Franklin was stationed in London, and he wondered why it took mail packets longer to reach New York than it took merchant ships to reach Newport, Rhode Island. Franklin asked his cousin, Timothy Folger, a Nantucket whaling captain, who told him that the sh merchant ships avoided an eastbound mid-ocean current, but mail packet captains sailed right into it. Franklin and Folger created a chart of the current and named it the Gulf Stream. You all know who this is. On October 1st in 1847, Mariah Mitchell stood on the roof of her parents' Main Street home and swept the sky with her telescope looking for anything unusual. 
At 10.30 p.m., she spotted a blurry, fuzzy light and realized it was a comet. She ran to get her father, William Mitchell, who confirmed it. Female astronomers were very rare in 1847, and her discovery caused a sensation. The comet was named in her honor. The King of Denmark awarded her a medal, and her story was told and retold in newspapers across America. Her life, her life is a story of firsts. She was the first woman to record a telescopic comet sighting, the first female professional to work for the federal government, for the Coast Survey and the Nautical Almanac, and the first woman elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. On October 6, 1904, builders poured the concrete walls of the Nantucket Historical Association's new museum on Fair Street. It was one of the first poured concrete buildings constructed in Massachusetts. Henry Wire headed the committee in charge and said his colleagues needed to be convinced that poured concrete was a viable option. Not one of the persons engaged in our work had ever seen a concrete building with the single exception of the Harvard Stadium, he said. Today, the NHA houses its research library in the historic structure. And in November 27, 1878, the Nantucket Journal announced the arrival of construction crews who would build the Wanacomet waterworks. 20-year-old Moses Joy had proposed a system to distribute water to every home. Residents strongly opposed it, saying that water could never be made to run uphill. But Joy persisted, built a steam-powered pumping station at Washing Pond, and, conduct, and constructed a 25,000-gallon elevated storage tank there. He also laid down 16,286 feet of pipe around town. The Wanacomet Water Company began service in 1879 with 63 customers and had grown to 350 customers in five years. All right, so here's winter. And it occurred to me last night when I was writing this, I'm going to sound like Alex Trebek as I go through the, the themes here. <laughs> Saving lives, governance, steamships, and abolitionists. Uh, okay. So on January 20th, 1892, the Cascada Life Saving Station rescued the crew of the British schooner H.P. Kirkham in what is one of the most often told Nantucket rescue stories. Cascada station keeper Walter N. Chase, pictured here playing with his dogs, and his crew were out for 26 hours in a 23-foot open boat during a ferocious winter storm. They saved seven men who they found clinging to the ship's icy rigging. The H.P. Kirkham left Halifax, Nova Scotia, and wrote to New York City when it went aground on the Rose and Crown Shoal, 15 miles southeast of Nantucket. Heavy seas tore off the bow within the first hour, and all the crew could do was light a distress signal and wait. Using superb seamanship, Chase's crew were able to bring the Kirkham crew onto their surf boat. Due to the extra weight, they discarded their sail and mast and waited out the storm for hours. Eventually, the crew, exhausted and hypothermic, rode the 15 miles back to shore. Nantucket's first life-saving station opened at Surfside in 1874. Eventually, other Nantucket stations were added in Cascada, Mattaquet, Tuckernuck, and Muskegon. In 1915, the U.S. Life-Saving Service and the Revenue Cutter Service merged to form the U.S. Coast Guard. Here is Captain Thomas F. Sandsbury. He served as keeper to two Nantucket life-saving stations and received many medals from the Massachusetts Humane Society for his bravery. He served the Muskegon Station from 1883 to 1886 and the Great Neck Station on Tuckernuck from 1881 until his death on February 22nd in 1903. In one rescue in February 1888 uh, involved three schooners stranded near Muskegon. Sandsbury and his crew spent three days bringing all aboard to shore. On December 28, 1866, a heavy gale had pulled the cross rip lightship from its mooring near Martha's Vineyard and carried it out to sea. The lightship was being manned by a Nantucket crew while the regular assigned crew were ashore on Liberty. No one heard anything from the cross rip for six weeks and all assumed the crew was lost when a letter arrived from New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> The letter said the Nantucket crew had arrived in the Crescent City at the end of January aboard the Henry L. Richardson of Thomaston, Maine, which had spotted the distressed lightship and come to the rescue. 
And on February 5th, 1918, the cross rip lightship was spotted by the Great Point Lightkeeper, broken from its mooring, trapped in an ice flow, and being pulled out to sea. A moving ice pack along with currents and tides had snapped the 63-year-old lightship from its mooring and taken it out to sea. Neither the ship nor the crew were ever seen again. In late December 1908, a devastating earthquake in southern Italy leveled cities and killed hundreds of thousands. With no place to send the survivors, the government put them on ships headed for America. Almost 850 displaced Italian citizens boarded the SS Florida in Naples and headed for New York City. One day before they were about to land, their ship struck the ocean liner Republic in a heavy fog 26 miles from the Nantucket lightship. The Republic had just installed a new Marconi wireless radio and used it to contact the Sconset station 47 miles away. It would be the first time the new radio technology was used to send a distress message, and mariners would later credit the Marconi radio with saving almost all hands. In all, six people died from the injuries, and more than 1,500 passengers and crew were rescued. Um, so it, there were many Nantucket lightships, and um, they were all stationed about 40 miles southeast of the island from 1854 to 1983, when the ship was replaced with a buoy equipped with electronics, which I don't think it's not quite as romantic. Uh, governance. So I noticed that a lot of the legislation and laws that affects Nantucket either from a federal, state, or local level happen in the winter. So that's what this section is about. On January 24th, 1746, Nantucket sea captains received town meeting approval for money to build a light hoist, loud, huh, lighthouse on Brant Point. It cost 200 pounds. Brand Point Light was the second lighthouse after Boston Light to be built in America. It either burned down or was knocked down by a storm multiple times between 1746 and 1795 when the federal government took ownership of it, and it was rebuilt each time. The light that stands at Brand Point today is the 10th lighthouse and was built in 1901. This one is the 9th uh, lighthouse, and I think the picture's from the 1880s. One thing about Nantucket history that I found really interesting was in both the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, um, members of the island were negotiating with both the British and the Americans. Uh, and I thought, how interesting that this little town is negotiating with foreign powers. Um, and it, it happened a lot. So this is William Roch. On March 11th, 1782, Nantucket whaling merchant William Roch and Samuel Starbuck traveled to Philadelphia and petitioned the U.S. Congress for permission to allow Nantucket whale ships to sail unmolested by American ships engaged in the war for independence. Two years after Roch, Roch petitioned them, the Congress took up his and Starbucks' petition. In its report, the committee found that the inhabitants of Nantucket have been and still continue in a very distressed state owing to the destruction of their whale fishery. And they allowed ships to sail as long as they had special papers given to them by the selectmen. Also during the American Revolution, Roach and a, a group of a town-appointed committee in 1779 approached the British and made a similar appeal to the British and uh, got them to agree to start targeting Nantucket ships. And another example of Nantucketers negotiating with governments, in August 22nd, 1814, a British warship anchored offshore and sent a message to Nantucket selectmen asking for a meeting. Privateers had made it impossible for Nantucket ships to sail, and the island people, close to starvation, were foraging for food from the land and sea and digging peat from the cranberry bogs for fuel. Nantucket selectmen agreed to meet, and the British proposed that if Nantucket residents took a neutral stand, then the English would allow some Nantucket ships to import goods. The terms included an agreement that for the duration of the war, townspeople would not fight the English, would give up their arms, would allow English ships to land on the island, and would not fish in local waters. That evening, voters gathered on the street in front of the Unitarian Meeting House for an impromptu town meeting and voted for it. Through a complicated set of events prevented the agreement from ever being enacted, I do find it interesting that, um, that the townspeople <laughs> were negotiating with the British or the British wanted to negotiate with the townspeople. 
Um, despite a Massachusetts law requiring towns to establish public schools for all, Nantucket did not adhere to the letter of the law until March 10, 1827, when town meeting voters agreed to fund public elementary school education. A public high school opened in 1838. Access to free education had been a hot topic since 1818, and the town had established a segregated public elementary school for non-white pupils in 1825 at the African Meeting House, which this is a photo of. In 1840, African-American student Eunice Ross qualified to enter public high school, but was denied because of her race. Some townspeople took up Ross's fight, and the island entered into a bitter integration debate. Six years later, Ross was finally able to enter high school after voters agreed to integrate the schools when it became clear that Absalom Boston, the father of another African-American student denied, had the means and the drive to pursue the issue in the courts. So as anyone who's ever been to town meeting knows, not all the issues have to do with large things like negotiating peace and integrating the schools. Um, this is a prairie dog. In February of 1900, town meeting voters authorized money to exterminate thousands of prairie dogs that threatened to overrun the island. Ten years earlier, someone had imported two pair of prairie dogs to hunt rats, and when it appeared that the expanding population of prairie dogs had invaded the golf courses, the issue went to town meeting. And there are no prairie dogs left to tell the tale. On February 1st, 1955, 16 Nantucket residents traveled to the Massachusetts State House and asked legislators to create a Nantucket Historic District Commission in order to preserve the island's pristine mid 19th century architecture, such as the Hadwin House pictured here. The commission would have jurisdiction over the exterior design of all downtown buildings and the village of Sconset. The legislator approved the law and the governor signed it. In 1972, the HTC's jurisdiction was expanded to include the entire island, as well as the outer islands of Tuckernuck and Muskegon. The town appointed commission started with six guidelines, which have evolved to include state and federal preservation laws and National Trust for Historic Preservation Standards. And on December 20th, 1983, Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis signed the Nantucket Islands Land Bank Bill into law. Nantucket town meeting voters accepted the legislation in January 1984 by a vote of 293 to 12. The first program of its kind in the United States, the Nantucket Land Bank is funded by a local tax on property sales and acquires land at fair market value to preserve open space forever. By 2014, the land bank had preserved more than 2,600 acres. Steamships. On February 24, 1854, an item in the Enquirer reported on a new Nantucket, Martha, a new, <laughs> on a new New Bedford, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket steamship company, the plan to offer commercial service to Nantucket. In addition, two railroad companies were also planning to establish a boat line. The editor noted, a little opposition in steamboating here would be no disadvantage to our own community. I think a sentiment still felt. Um, commercial service began in the early 1800s and the popularity of railroad travel in the 1880s also helped grow the island's summer tourism industry. On March 1st, 1946, the Massachusetts Steamship Company took over the holdings of the defunct island line in New Bedford and established service to Nantucket. It also immediately raised fares, which outraged the island. The boat line posted losses for much of its two years, and when yet another private steamship line failed, the legislature created a committee to investigate ways to ensure dependable boat service to the islands. Out of that came the New Bedford, Woods Hole, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket Steamship Authority, a state agency charged with providing passenger car and freight service to Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. In 1948, the authority purchased the Massachusetts Steamboat Company's holdings for $1.3 million and began service. In 1960, the SSA dropped New Bedford from its route as a cost-cutting measure, and gradually the authority purchased new boats that were, that were diesel-powered diesel and sold its last steamship in 1987. And finally, abolitionists. I don't know why, but a lot, there's a lot of abolitionists who were born or who died in the winter. So, um, 
So here is Mary Coffin Starbuck. She was born February 20th, 1645 in Haverhill, Massachusetts. Her father, Tristram Coffin, moved his family here in 1660, and she married Nathaniel Starbuck two years later. In 1701, at age 56, Mary converted from Puritanism to Quakerism and began preaching. Great Mary of Nantucket wielded power and was known for moving and eloquent sermons. Her devout belief in Quakerism, which emphasizes each person's direct connection to God through their inner light, helped make it the island's dominant religion during her lifetime and set the groundwork um, for future fights against slavery and for women's rights, social reforms that later Nantucket Quakers would help shape. Born on Nantucket in February of 1699, Elihu Coleman was a carpenter, Quaker, Quaker minister, and writer. His pamphlet called A Testimony Against the Anti-Christian Practice of Making Slaves of Men was published in 1733, making him one of the earliest anti-slavery advocates in America. His house, the second oldest house on the island, still stands, and this is a picture of its interior. Born in January 3rd, 1793, Lucretia Coffin was sent to a co-educational Quaker school in New York at age 13, where she met her future husband, James Mott. They married in 1811. Lucretia and James moved to Philadelphia, where they would spend the rest of their lives. Lucretia soon became active in Quaker meetings, the equivalent of a church service, and in 1821, she became a minister of the Society of Friends of Philadelphia. She spent her life pursuing social justice by speaking against slavery and in support of women's rights, as well as at yearly Quaker meetings. She witnessed the beginning of the women's movement at the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 and was elected the first president of the Equal Rights Association in 1866. She made her last speech at age 85 at the 30th anniversary of the Seneca Falls Convention, and her last visits to Nantucket were in 1869 and 1876. She died on November 11th in 1880. Robert Folger Walcott was born on Nantucket, March 17th, 79, 1797. Walcott attended Harvard Divinity School, where he'd begin a lifelong commitment to ending slavery and to Unitarianism. He served as a pastor of a Cape Cod Unitarian church briefly, but was dismissed for his anti-slavery views. A friend of William Lloyd Garrison, Walcott joined the New England and American Anti-Slavery Societies and first served as accountant. But Garrison appointed him general agent in 1846, and that new position made him one of anti-slavery's most important administrators, a post he held until 1865. And here is an 1860 letter to him complaining about uh, New Englanders' bad behavior when they attacked Wendell Phillips. Passionate abolitionist, poet, and teacher Anna Gardner died February 18, 1901. When Gardner was six, she witnessed her parents hide runaway slave Arthur Cooper in their attic. That effort to avoid a bounty hunter set Gardner on a lifelong path of fighting against slavery and for social justice. Born on Nantucket in 1860, Gardner organized three Nantucket anti-slavery conventions in the 1840s. She was the secretary of the Nantucket Anti-Slavery Society and the second person on the island to subscribe to William Lloyd Garrison's abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. In her early 20s, Gardner taught school at the African Meeting House, and at 50 years old, she left for Charlottesville, Virginia, where she started a free school for students of African descent. Ooh, I gotta talk fast. Um, on March 25th, 1845, African-American leader Edward Pompey petitioned the state legislature to end school segregation. The town had been tensely debating the question for five years and no resolution seemed near. Finally, after a six-year fight, voters voted to integrate the schools. An African-American whaling captain of the New Bedford ship Rising States in 1836 and a store owner in the New Guinea section of Nantucket, Pompey emerged as a leader in the island's African-American abolitionist movement at a young age. In 1832, William Lloyd Garrison appointed him Nantucket's agent for the Liberator, and he represented Nantucket at the 1834 New England Anti-Slavery Conference. Oh, anyhow, okay, here's spring, and the categories are Beginnings, German submarines, and whaling machines. Um, 
So on June 5th, 1672, a contract to create Nantucket's first whaling company was drafted between town proprietors and a man named James Loper. Yet there's no evidence that the townspeople or Loper ever actually killed any whales. It wasn't until 1690 that the proprietors successfully established a commercial fishery when they hired Cape Codder Ichabod Paddock to teach them how to do it. Paddock set up four areas on the south shore, each with a lookout station and a crew of six men. When a whale was spotted, the crew members set out in small boats to chase, harpoon, and kill it. They towed the animal to the shore and processed parts of the whale's body for oil on the beach. Nantucket's whaling business really took off in 1712 when Christopher Hussey brought back the first sperm whale. Nantucket whalemen found that the oil rendered from a sperm whale was superior to the other types of whale oil, and the market for it expanded quickly. On April 18, 1673, Francis Lovelace, governor of the province of New York, named Nantucket's new English settlement the town of Sherburne. When the founding English families first arrived, they settled on a protected inlet on the northeast side, which they felt had good access to the sea. Ownership of the island switched to Massachusetts when William and Mary came onto the throne in England and reestablished their American state boundaries. At the time, Nantucket requested to become a Massachusetts town, and in 1693, the switch was confirmed by law. On April 3, 1834, the Massachusetts legislature incorporated the Nantucket Athenaeum, a private institution dedicated to scientific and literary purposes. The Athenaeum opened in 1835 and hired a young teacher named Mariah Mitchell as their librarian. In the 1840s, anti-slavery conventions held there attracted famous abolitionists as well as women's rights advocates. By the end of the 19th century, as the idea of free public libraries gathered momentum nationally, some Athenaeum proprietors proposed joining the movement, but the membership voted it down. Turning the Athenaeum into a free public library came up for a, a vote several times in the 1890s, and finally, on, uh, April, uh, finally in 1900, its members and the town settled on a plan to make the Athenaeum a free public library. The Atlantic Silk Company was incorporated on March 31, 1836 by a special act of the legislature. A booming European market for silk led to the 1830s mulberry craze, which resulted in thousands of mulberry trees being planted around the country with the idea that they would feed silkworms. On Nantucket, local businessmen were eager to capitalize on the craze, and in addition, abolitionists called on consumers to substitute silk for cotton, which was picked by southern slaves. William H. Gardner and Aaron Mitchell built a silk factory on the southeast corner of Gay and Westminster, Street, Westminster, hmm, Westminster Streets, and once operational, Atlantic Silk made silk vesting and handkerchiefs. But there was trouble early on. The Nantucket people didn't like the industrial processes required to manufacture and dye the silk threads, and the trees did not thrive. And by 1884, 1844, the factory was closed. On April 19, 1880, the Massachusetts legislator, legislature granted a charter to Nantucket Railroad Company. The railroad served Nantucket from 1881 to 1917. The railroad changed hands and changed course many times, but couldn't make a profit and closed in 1917. On May 9, 1894, the Nantucket Historical Association was organized and incorporated on July 9th of that year. It adopted a constitution and bylaws in November and had a charter membership of 179 life members and 161 annual members. Also that year, the NHA gained ownership of the Quaker Meeting House on Fair Street, which became its headquarters. On May in May of 1916, the U.S. Congress proposed to amend the U.S. Constitution to allow women to vote and stated, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by a state on account of sex. The proposal came more than 60 years after women first called for the right to vote at the Seneca Falls Convention. In 1840, the 1848 convention was organized by Quakers, including Lucretia Coff and Mott. Among the many re resolutions at the uh, convention was the idea of giving women the right to vote. And on Nantucket, an island comfortable with having female leaders, the suffragette movement had many supporters. In 1853, famed orator Lucy Stone gave one of her first speeches on women's rights at the Nantucket Athenaeum. And this is Lucy Stone. 
During World War I, the Navy used patrol planes to spot German submarines. Stationed at Naval Air Station Chatham, the first hydroplane landed in Nantucket Harbor in April of 1918. The next time it came, on April 17th, the schools declared a holiday, and the children, along with most of the rest of the town, gathered on Brant Point to watch it arrive. For most of the crowd, this would be the first time they saw an airplane on the island. By June, large numbers of seaplanes, which were armed with guns and bombs and carried a homing pigeon in case the plane went down, were based in Chatham, one of the Navy's largest air stations. Um, World War ended in November of that year, but Nantucket had caught the bug for aviation and for seaplanes. A floating pier in the harbor was constructed for them to tie up, and on May 17, 1927, a seaplane made the first round-trip flight from Boston to Nantucket. Uh, in May, on May 14, 1927, the Nantucket Inquirer and Mirror announced the first air passenger service between Nantucket and Boston. The paper reported on a test run executed earlier that week. The Stinson Detroiter airplane flew in from Boston and instantly generated a lot of excitement. It was painted blue, had silver aluminum wings, and inside the four passenger seats were made of wicker and had blue leather cushions. The first Nantucket passenger to travel to Boston was 70-year-old Herbert Worth. Worth reported by telephone that the flight had taken an hour and five minutes. And in the beginning, Nantucketers did not embrace the automobile. The first cars to arrive in April of 1900 frightened the horses so badly that buggy passengers feared for their lives. In 1908, the island pressured the Massachusetts legislature into passing a law that banned cars from the island. The one exception was that cars were allowed on the state-owned Milestone Road. In 1913, mail carrier Clinton Folger, who you see here, um, had a horse tows car from downtown to the beginning of the Milestone Road on days when he delivered mail to Sconset. It, by 1916, many summer people accustomed to driving on the mainland brought their cars and used them. When they got into trouble with the law, the Massachusetts Automobile Association represented them. Once again, residents debated the issue and voted against it. And finally, on April 13th in 1918, town meeting voters narrowly elected to repeal, repeal the ban on cars. German submarines. May 27th, 1942, 340 miles north of Bermuda, a German submarine torpedoed and sank the Dutch ship Polyphemus. 60 people survived, including 14 people whose ship had been sunk by a German submarine five days earlier. The survivors abandoned their ships in five lifeboats, which became separated on the second night. On May 29th, one lifeboat was picked up and, brought, and its passengers brought to New York. A fishing boat 50 miles east of the Nantucket lightship picked up the crew of a second lightship, uh, lifeboat on June 1st and took the passengers to New Bedford. Another ship picked up the crew of a third lifeboat 130 miles east of Nantucket, and they landed in New Bedford. A Portuguese shipped up ship picked up the fourth crew on June 3rd and took them to New York. And finally, the U.S. Co Coast Guard picked up the passengers of the fifth lifeboat on June 5th and took them to Nantucket. On April 16th, 1944, a German submarine located south of Nantucket spotted a convoy leaving New York City bound for Great Britain. The Pan Pennsylvania, a large tanker in the convoy, straggled behind, and the German U-550 torpedoed it. The ship quickly caught fire and began to sink. The Navy and Coast Guard rescued the tanker's crew and detected the Germans as they attempted to escape. The military ships dropped bombs all around the submarine and severely damaged it damaged it, which forced it to surface. Above the water, German and American sailors exchanged gunfire while another destroyer rammed the submarine. The U.S. military picked up 13 Germans, and the rest of the crew went down with the U-boat. On June 3rd, 1942, a Canadian freighter picked up a lifeboat with 32 survivors of a German U-boat attack and brought them to safety in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The day before, a German submarine had sent seven lifeboats with 71 people adrift in northern Atlantic waters. On June 4th, a lifeboat with 20 survivors landed on Cape Cod, and on June 7th, the USS General Green rescued 19 survivors and brought them to Nantucket. This is a 1945 image of a German submarine crew member yelling for help. And whaling machines. 
Once the Pacific and Arctic Oceans were open to whaling in 1789, Nantucket ships were gone for up to four years at a time. And soon Nantucket sailors spend as much time in ports in Chile, Hawaii, Fiji, Tahiti, and New Zealand as they did at home. The long voyages required whalers to outfit their vessels with equipment used to process the whale into oil and essentially turn their ships into floating factories. On March 28, 1791, two brand new ships set out from Nantucket on whaling voyages that would take them all over the world. Nantucket whaling master Paul Worth, in command of the Beaver, would be the first American to fish in the Pacific, and the Washington, commanded by Captain George Bunker, would be the first to fly the new Stars and Stripes in Pacific waters in 1792. Nantucket's whaling era ended when the last ship, the Eunice H. Williams, commanded by Captain Zenas Coleman, arrived back in port in 1870. Once the largest whaling port in the world, by 1870, the island had lost 60% of its citizens and would lose another 1,000 people over the next five years. And then we come to summer. Um, and what cracked me up about summer is that the idea of having a festival every five minutes is not new. That Nantucket in the summer has been having meetings and conventions and celebrations and festivals um, going back a long ways. So you'll see a lot of them as I work my way through summer. So summer is gatherings, enlistments, and US presidents. In late June 1828, the island held its three-day sheep shearing celebration. Islanders started shearing sheep in 1696, and by 1775, the flock had grown to 15,000. The annual shearing became so popular with tourists that a festival grew up around it. And by 1828, many visitors came from off-island to enjoy the bustle of the sheep shearing, along with food, games, music, and dancing. The sheep were herded from common grazing areas around the island to Maya Comet. There they were moved through an elaborate series of fences that allowed handlers to segregate them by owner, wash them in Maya Comet Pond, and then shear them. I love having Ralph in the audience. <laughs> August 11th, 1841, Frederick Douglass, a fugitive slave, addressed an audience for the first time during anti-slavery convention at the Nantucket Athenaeum. It was with the utmost difficulty that I could stand erect or that I could command or articulate two words without hesitation and stammering, he later wrote. Leaders in the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society invited him to join their cause, and within five years, Douglass had an international reputation as a powerful orator. He wrote three autobiographies, edited several newspapers, took a leading role in the women's movement, and served for over half a century as an untiring advocate of racial justice. Nantucket ret um, Douglas returned to Nantucket to lecture four more times at anti-slavery conventions in 1842 and 1843 on the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850 and in 1881 on his experiences in the abolitionist movement. He died on February 20th, 1895, at 77 years old. On August 18th, 80, 1881, a three-day coffin reunion commemorating the 200th anniversary of Tristram Coffin's death ended. More than 500 coffins attended, and the festivities included speeches, a banquet, and a ball. During the reunion, Tristram Coffin of Poughkeepsie, New York, went to look at his ancestral home, the Jethro Coffin House on Sunset Hill, and he was dismayed to find it falling down. Coffin purchased the house and later donated it to the Nantucket Historical Association in 1924. Now called the oldest house, the NHA operates it as a historic site, and it's open to the public in the summer. This is the one I thought was, like, the most shaky. On July 11th, 1895, a burst of cannon fire, steam whistles, and bells kicked off the final day of a three-day celebration to commemorate the 100-year anniversary of the town's name change from Sherburne to Nantucket. It seemed, I don't know. Um, but the event included a parade, concerts, fireworks, a baseball game, bicycle races, swimming competitions, a life-saving demonstration, literary exercises, boat races, a reunion, a banquet, and a ball. Local telephone service had been available since 1887, but the first long-distance telephone call occurred in August of 1916. Every seat in the Nantucket Athenaeum Hall was wired and equipped with a watch case telephone receiver. 
Telephone Company General Manager William R. Driver Jr. called from Boston. This was followed by a three-way conversation between Joseph Brock, president of the Pacific Club, speaking from the captain's room, William F. Macy from his home in West Medford, and the Honorable William Crapo from his home in New Bedford. Following that call, the group heard the national anthem sung over the phone from Boston, and they spontaneously rose and sang. Later, telephone company representatives demonstrated how to use the long-distance lines, and islanders made calls to friends throughout Massachusetts. On July 16, 1921, the island concluded a two-day celebration marking the 150th anniversary of Nantucket's Masonic Union Lodge, the island's oldest fraternal organization. Union Lodge, chartered in 1771, is the fifth oldest Masonic organization in the country. In 1890, the Nantucket Masons built a hall at the corner of Union and Main Streets, which they still use today. And the Nantucket Civic League hosted the Neighbors Fifth Annual Festival on Commercial Wharf on August 24th, 1944. 1,500 people turned out to look at displays of Nantucket crafts and art. There was a pavilion that featured sporting games. There was music. A local mariner provided boat rides around the harbor. And there were surf boat races between the Cascada and Mattaquet stations. Mattaquet won. The Nantucket Civic League was founded in 1903 and has a mission of informing the citizens through participation. Uh, enlistments. Hmm, I have a page that's out of order. That's not good. All right, well, I'm going to wing it and tell you what this is. <laughs> um, this is the Nantucket chapter of the Grand Army of the Republic, which are Civil War veterans. Um, Nantucket sent 400 men to the Civil War, of whom 73 died. Um, and uh, among them was U.S. Navy Rear Admiral Seth Ackley. Um, like his father, who died when he was young, Ackley, tur Ackley turned to the sea when he came of age. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1866. Actually, I think I'm supposed to be there. And mustered out to fight the Civil War. He served for 22 years and retired in 1901 due to health issues. But he was reinstated in the U.S. Navy in 1904 by an act of Congress and promoted to Rear Admiral in 1907. On June 29, 1900, Nantucket's highest-ranking naval officer, Vice Admiral Marcel Gwynn of Sconset, was born. He graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1924. Um, during World War II, he served on the aircraft carrier Hornet, which was sunk during a battle, and he later served on the carrier Saratoga. He was director of the Naval Air Test Center in Maryland and was appointed commander of the aircraft carrier Admiralty Islands in 1944. He continued to shift between teaching, testing, and field leadership positions until he retired to Nantucket. And last category, oof, it's going to be close, uh, is presidents. For some reason, Nant uh, people, U.S. presidents visit Nantucket in the summer. Um, On August 27, 1874, President Ulysses S. Grant arrived on the steamship Island Queen. As Hill's New Bedford band played music, the bells of several church steeples rang and cannons were fired from Commercial Wharf. The president and his large party were paraded through most of downtown and stopped at the Jared Coffin House for lunch. After eating, the group returned to their boat so that President Grant could next visit Cape Cod. At the time of his visit, President Grant was attending a Methodist camp meeting in Martha's Vineyard where this photo was taken, and the president is the uh, gentleman seated on the porch. Although it was, his visit was brief, President Grant's ceremonial visit was a key factor in establishing Nantucket as a tourist destination in the late 19th century. Former U.S. President Grover Cleveland visited Nantucket in June of 1897. In 1892, Cleveland had established the first summer White House on Cape Cod. A June 12, 1897 item from the Nantucket Inquirer and Mirror under the heading INCOG said Cleveland had visited Nantucket as a guest of Commander E.C. Benedict aboard the steam yacht Oneida. They were given a private tour, and no one would have known of his visit except that the party stopped to send a telegraph to Mrs. Cleveland. 
In September of 1882, President Chester Arthur made an unannounced visit to Nantucket on the steamer Dispatch. His arrival was not kept secret for long, however, and when he landed on Steamboat Wharf, a large gathering of townspeople cheered for him. The presidential party had lunch at a local home and toured the island in the afternoon. On September 13, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson and his wife visited Nantucket on the yacht Mayflower. The Wilsons brought their daughter, Mrs. Frances B. Sayre, to the island to reunite with her family in Sconset. The island offered him a grand welcome. Schools and businesses were closed, and most of the town gathered on Steamboat Wharf to cheer him when he landed at the Yacht Club Pier. The president waved his hat and acknowledged the greeting. The party rode to Sconset in horse-drawn carriages. At the Sayre Cottage, the president and Mrs. Wilson visited with their grandchildren and stayed for dinner. They returned to town by 10 p.m. and left the next morning on the Mayflower. On June 19, 1933, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt sailed the schooner Amberjack II into the harbor. The president remained on the boat for his entire visit, but did receive visitors. According to newspaper reports, the president was in high spirits and announced that he did not plan to set foot on land for two weeks. And finally, on September 1st, 1963, President John F. Kennedy and his family went for a cruise on the yacht Honey Fitz and briefly visited Nantucket. Moored in the harbor, neither the president nor the first lady got off the 92-foot yacht, but seven children, including Caroline and John Kennedy Jr., were taken to the Brant Point Coast Guard Station. The outing also included four Secret Service men, a nurse, and the Kennedy dog, a German shepherd named Clipper. And just under the wire, that is my presentation. It was like a speed walking through <laughs> Nantucket history. Do I have time for a question or two? Yeah. All right. I think we have time for a couple of questions before we head over to the bookshop. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I'll run over with the microphone. Anybody? I've overwhelmed them. <laughs> a lot of things to ask questions about. Um, yeah. I guess I'll ask you one. Did you have a particular fact that you had no idea existed and was your favorite by the end of it? Yeah, there were a couple. Um, one that I thought was really interesting was during World War II, there was an escaped German prisoner of war living in Sconset for a short period of time, about six months. And um, he told everyone that he was a Swiss handyman. And the, it's a long story. It involves... He, he wooed a woman while he was at the, he was at Fort Devens in the middle of the state, and there was a civilian truck driver who was a woman, and he started sending her notes and telling her he loved her, and he, he wooed her, and then when he escaped, he tracked her down, and she bought the, the uh, Sconset cottage, and anyway, so uh, he survived here for about six months, and then people kind of got wise to him, and the FBI showed up and took him away. <laughs> And he went back to Germany, and you'd think that would be where the story would end, but no. From Germany, he continued to write this woman letters and profess his love to her and say he wanted to get married. And So three years later, she went to Germany, and she married him, and she came back, but he didn't, and he, she supported him and sent him stuff. And eventually, he moved to the States, and they moved back to Sconset, and, um, and, but things were not good. He was very sullen. He wouldn't talk to her. He wouldn't consummate the marriage. And she couldn't figure out what was going on. She thought um, if they moved to Boston, maybe he'd be happier. And they moved to Boston, and he ran away, and she never heard from him again. <laughs> So, in 1950, she um, petitioned the court for an, annul an annulment, which is how I found the story. It was a, um, it was a report about the, the court hearing. And so, um, she did disclose that he was very distressed to learn that just marrying an American citizen didn't auto automatically make him an American citizen. So, I have to assume from that that he thought that he had figured out how to be an American citizen, and it didn't work. So, that one I found... Really interesting. Um, Pretty good. Uh, the, I like the prairie dogs. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I just. I just thought that was just weird and odd and great. Does anyone have any any other questions? All right. Well, oh, oh. we got one. book at some point, and what might it be if you do? <laughs> um, yeah, I think I might be ready to write an actual book now that has chapters and, and a plot and stuff. Um, I, but, it, I don't, but the what is 
hard. I don't know. And there's been so many great books written about Nantucket history. I would, would want to do something that was a little different. So I, I don't know. I'm not sure. But I'm open to it. Great. Right. If no one else has any other questions, thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Amy's going to be in the shop.